I was watching the BFG the other day, and for me, the most fantastical, unbelievable part of the film wasn't the snozcumbers, wasn't the flying giants, wasn't the dreams in jars. Oh no, it was the resolution for the film. Do you know what the resolution for the film is? Sophie finally has an idea to end the tyranny of the giants, and she remembers that she has a queen and she can ask her for help. Even more outrageous, the royal family does step in and save the day. My name's Lena, I am British, and I will not be watching the coronation this year. Here's why. Ah, his royal majesty, King Charles head of the realm, defender of the faith, or has he will forever be nicknamed in my head, the man who called Princess Diana chubby. He has also been called the most effective environmentalist in history. Seven years before Wallace Brocker coined the phrase global warming, Prince Charles was giving his first speech on the environment in 19. 68. He was, in fairness, there before it was called. He's called climate deniers the headless chicken brigade, he is staunchly against subsidies for fossil fuel companies, and he even wrote a book on the subject. Granted, it is only 48 pages long and co-written by two other people, but what can I say? Impoverished subjects can't be choosers. In Spare, fave memoir of the year so far, Prince Harry tells us of Charles that he has always been a worker, he believes in work, but his own work was also a kind of religion because he was <laughs> sorry I hate to break it to you Charles but your job is literally religion because the only reason you have it is because some people believe that God appointed you to it anyway his own work was also a kind of religion because he was furiously trying to save the planet countless times late at night Willie and I would find him at his desk with mountains of bulging blue bags his correspondence more than once we discovered him face on the desk fast asleep. He established the International Sustainability Unit in 2010. He launched Terra Carta. He'd been tracking and publishing his own carbon footprint since like 2007. He's installed biomass boilers and solar panels on his own house. And apparently he's converting his Aston Martin to run on surplus old wine and cheese. I, I actually kid you not. He saw the champagne socialist and he said, hold my glass. He talks to his plants to make them grow and he is such a tree hugger that allegedly he shakes hands with every tree he plants. So as somebody who is quite concerned about the climate crisis, not as a special hobby, not as a special interest, just because if you read the first few pages of the Wikipedia page, it would be illogical not to. As somebody who is in a climate anxiety spiral, should I be comforted that King Charles seems to be the only royal family member who publicly is aware of the climate crisis, but he is also seemingly trying to do something about it. Should we be excited? No, and here are three reasons why. The first reason is his personal action. When it comes to his diet, for which I will remind you, there is no limit monetarily or skill-wise. Somebody else cooks all of his meals and somebody else pays for them. He can choose whatever he wants. He says, I haven't eaten meat and fish on two days a week and I don't eat dairy products on one day a week. And I agree with him. If a lot of people did that, it would reduce the pressure on the climate, but it is a weird flex given his resources, just saying. If I knew as much as he did and I had as much nutritionists and chefs at my disposal, it would be something I would probably do, but I probably wouldn't boast about it. The average Brit, which includes me, has a carbon footprint of around 10 tonnes a year. Pretty hefty, not ideal, but do you want to know the carbon footprint of the royal family every year? Because I don't, but I've already researched it, so a problem shared is a problem halved, right? It's 3,810 tonnes. You can actually get a breakdown of every flight that costs over £15,000, which is not all of the flights, um, on the Royal Family's website it is public information. And just in 2021 to 2022 alone, Prince Charles seemed to have made it quite a regular hobby to take private domestic flights. The total of all of these flights cost about two and a half million pounds and they're broken down. Thus, as you can see, most popular way to fly is helicopter for the Royal Family. And how much of that is Charlie? I hear you ask. Well, I did find some 2019 stats that might give us a good idea. In 2019, he took 17 private jets, three scheduled flights, and two RAF or helicopter rides. As you can see in this chart, that's more than William, Kate, Harry, Meghan, and the Queen combined. Fun fact, in 2019, the Queen actually had the lowest carbon footprint of all of the royal family, despite the fact that she is the most in demand and head of the realm and would have the most excuses, if there were any, to travel. Her annual emissions tot 
reported up to 7.7 tonnes, which is less than a return flight from London to Perth. So in those years when the demand for his work was less than it will be now that he is king, that's how he chose to run his life, especially when you have the royal train at your disposal, which again, fun fact, are we all not grateful for the manna from heaven that is Lena's 2am Wikipedia holes? The royal train is a diesel electric hybrid. It's worth saying that usually I wouldn't hold somebody's personal actions as necessarily a direct contradiction to their environmental beliefs, but there is largely because most civilians don't have control over the large amount of their carbon footprint. Charles' scale of resources plus his agency over them kind of overshadows the speeches, if I'm honest. They might be persuasive, but he doesn't seem to have convinced himself. Or simply, maybe he thinks, and I'm sure most of his ancestors would agree, the rules simply don't apply to him. Personal action aside, I think what matters more is political action. As a British kid, I grew up indirectly or indirectly being taught that the royal family were largely decorative. They didn't have any say in running the country because that would be weird because we live in a democracy where we're supposed to vote on stuff. But as an adult, I chucked my reading glasses on and it would turn out that that's not quite the case. In fact, in Joan Smith's book, Down With The Royal, she says, the royal supposed lack of power and influence is the most pernicious of all public fantasies, worse even than the sentimental outpourings that accompany the family's engagements, marriages, and births. Turns out they do have the power to meddle and oh, meddle they do. The queen, for instance, has vetoed loads of bills and not just like small tiny insignificant bills either like airstrike military bills charles whilst i remind you unelected is renowned for lobbying parliament calling hundreds of meetings with ministers for example i found out in 2010 after the general election he called 53 private meetings with cabinet ministers for which the minutes are not available not allowed. We're not allowed to know what they talked about. His letters to Parliament are so frequent that they have the nickname Black Spider Memos because of his bad handwriting. Again, in Down With The Royals, sources below. She tells us that his consent is required for legislation which affects his hereditary revenues, personal property or other interests, and that the Queen and Prince Charles have been asked to approve bills on subjects as varied as higher education, paternity pay, ID cards, civil partnerships, and even high hedges, like the height of hedges that are allowed in the UK. Civil servants were warned that a majority plank of bills would have to be removed if either the Queen or the Prince withheld consent, and even amends to bills had to be submitted for royal approval. I don't like it. That's my initial instinctual feeling. I don't, I don't like it. An article in Global Citizen makes a good point that perhaps Charles's involvement is particularly valuable when it comes to the environment because he appeals to conservatives in a similar way that David Attenborough appeals to conservatives, perhaps with a small c, on the environmental issue, which is more often highlighted by the left. And while I can see that as a thing, like maybe it's good, there is an instinct there to say, oh, because he is meddling in the government in a way that actually benefits my political persuasions and my political worries, which is the environment, I can overlook it. And I think that might be a slippery slope into dystopian hell, even though the instinct there is to be like, ah, as long as it's for the good of the planet. The issue here isn't that Charles is speaking up. We love that for him. But the awareness that for me to get something that I care about discussed in Parliament, I have to rally 99,999 other people to sign a petition for that to even be a possibility. Charles, who I might remind you has absolutely no qualifications in environmental science and I'm not the smartest cookie in the jar, but he actually does have a lower educational score than me. I looked it up because I'm petty, okay? Eat my dust, Charles. He, he can waltz in and influence things. Unelected, unquestioned, unwatched. The climate crisis is something I have been trying to learn about on this channel in public as I go for at least the past three years. And from everything that I have read, one of the big takeaways that I have had is that we need experts. It's a lack of democracy that has got us into this spot because God knows if everybody knew what was going on, nobody would vote for it. So looking to a man to save us who not only embodies anti-democracy but actively acts on it seems mm, naive at best.
When it comes to Charles's career as an eco-activist, it appears that he himself has admitted that he is about to enter his flop era. As a king under a constitutional monarchy in Britain, Charles is expected to be politically neutral, and he said himself in speeches that he will have to reel it in, and he knows that. Now, what is politically neutral? I hear you cry. Well, don't worry, I found that too. This is an index on the royal's website where you can look up all of the causes the Queen has advocated for that she considered during her reign to be politically neutral. And I will tell you, the findings are wild. Go through that website with a large bottle of wine at your own peril. But it does remain to be said that I do not believe that tax avoidance is politically neutral, that Christianity, and it's particularly the royal family's brand of Christianity, is politically neutral. I don't believe the consumption of luxury items is politically neutral. I don't believe that the military is politically neutral. The older I get and the more right wing I'm told that I will grow into being, the more left I become and the more I feel that the left is being gaslit into feeling like the beliefs that they have are spicy little political opinions and what the right have are cold, hard, facts. That left-wing opinions are kind of like genitalia, like it's okay to have them but don't bring them out on the dinner table, whilst right-wing thinkers are allowed to sit at the table happily and pretend that they didn't pick the height of the table, the wood that it was carved from, and who is allowed to sit at it. So if we don't think that spending money is politically neutral, then perhaps we can interrogate how much 345 million pounds would get us. Why 145 million pounds? Well, because that is the most accurate, well-sourced guesstimate of how much the royal family truly costs the British public every year because the royal family don't actually release those figures. Goody! Or not in their entirety. Anyway, I'll tell you what that money would get us. It would get us 15,000 newly qualified teachers, 15,500 newly qualified nurses, or equally qualified firefighters, or even if you're right wing and police is something that you're concerned about, it would, it would buy us 17,000 police officers. I used to kind of subscribe to what I now believe is a myth that the real reason that we get so much tourism and travel in the UK is because we have something magical, which is a live living royal family. But it has been pointed out to me several times now that the French economy and tourism is actually doing way better than us. And well, we know what they did to their royals. But how powerful is King Charles? In 2023, he did appear in Times 100, most influential people in the world. So it would seem quite powerful. But if he is this powerful and he has been talking about the climate crisis for this long and he seems sincere like look at this quote he describes that he doesn't want to leave his grandchildren a poison chalice that's quite a vigorous strong statement for a royal so then we can assume that he's not lying about trying to influence things some of what he does can't be just performative he must be trying so the second option is he's actually not as influential as we think he is. In this world where arguably billionaires rule the roost in the way that the monarchy used to, it is interesting to look at how much the royal family has. Now, the royal family are famously good at concealing how much wealth they have, but the closest estimates I can find for Charles alone is 1.8 billion, which is granted quite a lot of money. Some would say it's more than he needs, but interestingly, he doesn't even appear in the Sunday Times rich list top 50. He's not there. It's clear that the art of statecraft, of influence through clout alone, doesn't have the impact that we think it does. Good examples, I think, of statecraft or of his ex-wife, Diana. She seemed quite self-aware of the limits of what she could do and used the eyes on her to promote other people's work. I don't think even she would claim that she ended the stigma around the AIDS crisis, but she sure did help. But to emphasize, other people did that. Other people did all the work around that. She did the statecraft cherry on top. But I do genuinely think that Charles thinks that if he can write a more sincere or convincing speech that he can change the course of history, which of course, if he was born 200 years earlier, he actually could have. So can we blame him? No, but we have to recognize that what he has done has not been significant enough to stop things from going completely south when it comes to the climate crisis and our management of it in the UK. Is it us? Are we the problem? Hilary Mantel's now very, very famous essay about the royal family, which is brilliant, by the way, compares the royal family to pandas. They're expensive to conserve, ill-adapted to any modern environment, but aren't they interesting? 
aren't they nice to look at? And she implies that that's why we keep them around because they're interesting and they are nice to look at. A spokesman from the palace did point out that when it comes to Charles's carbon emissions, he isn't personally involved in those decisions around his transport arrangements and they are made based on what is possible within the constraints of time, distance and security. In order for him to undertake as many engagements as he does across the UK and around the world, he sometimes has to fly. Let's just put that aside and say well, this is kind of debatable, but the interesting point in that sentence for me is has to. It's not a biological necessity, it's not a moral necessity, it's not a medical necessity. So what kind of necessity is it? I would say it's a social necessity. Like so many climate issues, perhaps the problem with King Charles is that it simply comes down to supply and demand. And all do we demand them. I've already talked about how our obsession with the royal family makes them inherently, as humans, unsafe. And that not only has a monetary impact, but also a climate one. Video about Prince Harry up here. A hundred million of their 345 million pound alleged budget is on security, which includes having to take private planes and ship a large amount of people with you wherever you go. And it's we, the public, who demand these trips. The magical healing touch of somebody appointed by the Christian God to lay hands, to heal our sick, to feed the poor, to bless our endeavors, to snip our ribbons. And whenever we get a new panda, we demand new plastic paraphernalia to celebrate. Hats, flags, bunting, gimme. There's a young Indian writer called Sashti Bharata who put it perfectly. If not exactly divine, British society still considers its monarchs above the normal run of human beings. And because there is no rational basis for this belief, we call it a mystique. But such a mystique creates an unhealthy dialectic. We disapprove of the principle of hereditary as valid basis for social discrimination. In theory, at any rate. And yet the apex of the social pyramid of the monarchy exemplifies that very principle. The monarchy provides sanction to caste. Oh, what Charles is to me is a man, probably very sincerely, trying to conserve the environment, whilst also ironically trying to conserve the very structures that are ruining it in the first place. He can't or won't see the wild contradictions in that, but we can, can't we? There's a line in this book that really hit me. It says, a vast number of stories focus on individual protagonists, on heroes with a thousand faces. Because of the human predilection for storytelling, we tend to personalize agents, concentrating agency in individuals or figures. The problem comes when climate change is produced, not individually, but collectively. The conversation here can't be, is Prince Charles nice or nasty? Whatever evidence we collect, we can never truly know. A friendly, unelected overlord is still an unelected overlord. And so, Lena, what's your point? What do you want us to do about this? Well, my first suggestion is to join me in not watching. The opposite of love isn't hate, it's apathy. And I, for one, would love to see some stats that are embarrassingly low and tune actual elected politicians into the fact that blind support from the monarchy isn't truly what the electorate want because those stats, whatever we're thinking when we're watching it, are read globally as reverence. If you are getting some time off like we are in the UK for the coronation, if you're getting a bank holiday of sorts, read about the climate crisis if you wish, plan your actions if it makes you happy, but most of all have a rest for your ancestors because whether they come from almost any other country on the globe or you're of British descent and two generations or more ago all of your ancestors were down mines, up chimneys, generally deprived living standards because of the attitudes and beliefs perpetuated and enforced by the monarchy. There are very few people watching who aren't owed historically just a little rest due to this man's shenanigans and the shenanigans of his historic family. Thank you so much for watching this video. Do you think that the Royal family are unsustainable in both senses of the words? Let me know in the comments below. Why do I keep caring about the royal family? Well, there's an answer in this video here. Why do I keep talking about it? If you'd like to watch some non-royal family themed content on the climate crisis, that can be found over here. I'd love it if you've subscribed so you stay around. I tried to source everything that I said in this video quite thoroughly. It's all linked in the description, but I'm always happy to learn more and be corrected. This video is made possible by the Gumption Club who tipped me per video to make sure these videos keep happening. That's very, very nice of them. Thank you to them. And all that remains to say is, rock snug out.